I think we need some help today. Gwen needs some help today. <laughs> she can't be the only person saying amen and clapping. So listen, 11 o'clock, you know you're my favorite, right? Nine o'clock needed a little help. They needed 10 Gwens, and so we got one Gwen, but we need some more. So can we just say thank you, God, for your goodness? Like, I thought, I thought there were one or two places in the sermon at nine somebody should have said amen, and it was like half-hearted four people. And so, like, Gwen, like, your crew right here, but like, come on, some people in the back and some people over here, like, we can have some amens today. Uh, not, not if, not... I'm not saying like if I say something good. I'm saying like if you hear God say something good, then uh, don't hold back, okay? Can we make that agreement? Don't hold back. Okay. So I was reading this, um, this, this I don't even know, a blog, an article. Robbie Castleman's a professor of biblical studies, and she was talking about she overheard some students in a conversation. And it was a student who she had had for a while talking to a brand new student, and, and the student said, this is what you need to know about her as a professor with her, it's all about Jesus. So you just need to know in her classes, it's all about Jesus. If, somebody, if, you, if you overheard somebody talking about you, and they said, with them, here's what you need to know, it's all about, fill in what blank. If people, coworkers are like, hey, let me tell you about them at work with them. It's all about school. You're at school and you're hanging out and a, a student's telling another student about you and they're like, hey, you just need to know with her. You need to know with him. It's all about. I mean, some of you are sort of whispering Jesus, but I'm not sure if it's true. I mean, it's a radical different thing to, to think this isn't me like preacher Aaron trying to say, hey, if everybody's talking about me, they're talking about Jesus. I don't know. And it may take us to pause for a moment and listen a little bit or ask some questions and maybe somebody else could help us think this through. But I'm here to say, this series is here to say, whether we're living it out right now or not, it's all about Jesus. And our life is all about Jesus, our hope is all about Jesus, and the story of Scripture is all about Jesus. And so we're talking about these seven I am statements as we approach Easter, these declarations that Jesus makes where he's like, this is who I am. <coughs> There's going to be a lot of that, so just bear with me. I have a hot tea. I'll survive. <coughs> Pray for me, though. But when Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, he's saying these things to introduce us to his very character and nature. But here's the question that I'm asking you. Who is Jesus in your life? And what difference is he making? Because if he is who he says he is, then we can't half-heartedly say, hey, my life's all about Jesus. It either is or it isn't. And, and there's, there's, there's a, a test, there's a litmus test that's going on here. And so I don't, I don't know how many times I'm going to say that today, but, but Gwen's definitely going to need your help to get that through to us today. If you have your Bibles, grab them and turn to John chapter 10, and I'll get there in just a moment. In this series, here's what maybe you've noticed. We call it the aftermath, and here's the reason why. In every one of these declarations that Jesus makes, there's a story before the story. So in week one, before we got to I am the bread of life, <coughs> here's what we talked about. Jesus fed 5,000 with fish and loaves. Like he barely had anything. And, and, and in the hands of the disciples, a miracle happened. The bread multiplied and they fed a multitude in the hands of the disciples. And as they walked away, they seemed to miss the point of the whole thing. So Jesus says, hey, hey. I am the bread of life to try to help them afterwards understand what's happened. Last week we talked about Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But before he said, I am the light of the world, the very story before that was a woman was dragged into the middle of a worship service. She was said to have been caught in the act of adultery. I don't even know what that means. But she's drugged before in shame and humiliation to put her down, to put her on the spot and to test Jesus and Jesus basically says, I am the light of the world. Whoever is going to follow after me doesn't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This week, the story before what we're going to get to is found in John chapter 9. 
In John chapter nine, they're, they're, Jesus and his disciples are journeying through a city. <clears throat> and Jesus sees a man who is born blind. Now get this. There's not a lot of congenital, like from birth things that we read about in scripture. This is from birth, congenital, um, born blind. And the disciples see Jesus, see this man, and the disciples must notice that Jesus is noticing this man, and so they ask a question. Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, that man or his parents, that he was born blind? Back in old school Judaism, there was even a thought that a baby could sin in the womb and come out with a defect. Like, what? What? And they're asking listen, a theological question. They're asking a question about suffering. And they're saying, with what's going on right here in this person's life, it, we're trying to make sense of this. Who sinned? And Jesus is like, nobody. That, that's not how this works. Nobody sinned. This, this child, this precious child was born like this so that the glory, the works of God could be revealed in their life. And so Jesus, do you know the story? He spits. He spits in the mud and he makes a cake of mud and he wipes it over this man's eyes, tells him to go bathe in the pool of Siloam and he is healed miraculously. He's healed and transformed so miraculously he comes back to the village that his whole entire life he's been born in, he's been begging for food, help, help, because that's how he would make a livelihood and the people didn't even recognize him. And they're like, who are you? You look like the man who used to be born, who was born blind, but you can't be him because that guy was blind and you can see. And he's like, I'm him. He's like, no, you're not. That guy was blind. They cannot see the work of God in their midst. So they bring this man to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and they're like, you gotta help us understand what's going on here. You religious leaders, try to explain this to me. And the Pharisees are like, what in the world did Jesus do on the Sabbath? You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. They're like, there's a man who was healed of his blindness and all you can argue about is the Sabbath? Adventures in missing the point? And so they're like, this is wrong. I don't know how anybody could do anything on the Sabbath. This man is not from God. And Jesus is like, really? If, if I'm not from God, then how do I do what I just did? And so Jesus picks up an idea and he says, if you could actually see, you would see that these are the works of God, but because you're blind, you keep missing God. And the Pharisees are like, you're calling us blind? That guy used to be blind. And Jesus says, you're blind because you think you can see, but you actually can't. So pride and arrogance were at the heart, causing them to not be able to actually see the work of God, Jesus, right in front of them. That ends, and the very next thing that happens is chapter 10, verse 1. Before I get there, real quick, Jesus is going to give us a parable, um, a metaphor, an analogy, and he's going to use something interesting, shepherd and sheep. Now, if he was using a general and soldiers, we're like, yeah, we're the soldiers. If he was using like a coach and the all-stars, we would be like, we're the all-stars, but instead he uses a shepherd and a sheep. And the sheep are known throughout scripture to be helpless, dependent, um, stubborn. Sound like anybody you know, don't even, don't even elbow your husband. Stinky. That's what a, sh a sheep is known as. A shepherd could either be kind, caring. A good shepherd would have sheep that look healthy. Or a shepherd could be demanding and harsh and cruel. And when he walks near the sheep cower for fear. And so Jesus is going to use this analogy that is used all throughout scripture. And FYI, sheep is not the compliment, but FYI, FYI, we're the sheep. You can't read your Bible and not find that out. So chapter 10, verse one, Jesus starts and he says, very truly, now that's just an interesting thing. Like it's sort of um, old school Bibles, King James and such, verily, verily, go back to the Greek, amen, amen. Modern for all of you teachers, can I please have your attention? <coughs> it's listen up, very truly I tell you Pharisees, he's speaking to them. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief, and a robber. 
a thief and a robber, anybody who climbs in another way. I got a picture of what, what a, a sheep pen would look like back in that day. <coughs> There's one entrance, and Jesus is saying, anybody who climbs over the wall, anybody who's trying to sneak around the backside, that person's a thief and a robber. They don't belong there. They've got ulterior motives, and you better watch out because the shepherd, the one who's in charge, would come through the door, would come through the opening. And so anybody else, what he calls thieves and robbers, climb in by some other way, okay? We've got sort of what Jesus is trying to set up there. Verse two, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. And the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep <coughs> by name and leads them out. So, so Jesus says when you're looking at that, that sheep pen, the, the one who comes through the gate, that's the shepherd of the sheep. And, and there was often a gatekeeper back in that day that would open up the door. So there would be like multiple shepherds would have multiple flocks of sheep. Don't think like thousands of sheep. Think like I had three and you had 10. And we would all keep them in that pen at night. And so the amazing thing about sheep is they so got to know the voice of the shepherd that there could be five of us with each of our five sheep inside of that pen. And if I walked up to that door and I said, come on, sheep. I don't know what a shepherd says. Here, sheep. <laughs> they would recognize my little southern draw and they would be like, that's my shepherd. And my five would come running out and yours would stay put. Yours would be like, that's a stranger's voice. I don't know his voice. But my five would be like, that's my shepherd. And they would come on out. And so what we're told here is the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd knows the name of the sheep. Back in that day, shepherds caring for their sheep, they named their sheep. You didn't have nameless sheep any more than you have a nameless golden doodle in your house. You don't have a nameless cat. You don't have a cat in your house that like, hey, cat. Maybe you do. That's a, you need counseling if that's you. <laughs> But we name our cats, we name our dogs, they name their sheep, they knew them by name, they knew the peculiarities of the sheep. They'd be like, that sheep, that sheep's stubborn. Oh, this is my favorite sheep. I know you're not supposed to have favorites when it comes to pets and cats and, and, and kids, but we all do, <laughs> but we all do. That sheep is my favorite. But then there may be a warning, watch out for that sheep. That sheep is hard-headed. They knew their sheep and they would call them by name because the sheep knew the voice of the shepherd. So by analogy, here, here's, here's what we're trying to get at. We're trying to unpack. Do you know the voice of your shepherd? Do you know the voice of your God? There's all kinds of voices in this world that are calling, clamoring for our attention. And here's my question. Do you know the voice of the one who cares and the one who wants to lead you to life and the one who wants to provide for you? Can you distinguish his voice from all of the other voices that are calling out to you in this world? And you want to know how you can? The only way you can know fully is through the word of God. You can know the voice of the shepherd. You can know what he sounds like as you get to know his word and his spirit begins to work inside of you. And I'm just gonna tell you, some of you know my voice pretty well. My voice is not enough. You need to hear Jesus's voice for yourself. When, when I was like, I, I hate to say this, I'm gonna say it, 26 years ago, I was in seminary. Was there a gasp? I think I heard a gasp. 26 years ago, I was in seminary and there was no podcasting 26 years ago. There was no iPhone 26 years ago. If you wanted to listen to a sermon, you got a cassette tape. Let me explain that to you young people. It was plastic, it was a rectangle, and it was reel to reel. this tape would go around. Well, there was a guy, this dude, and I'd call him a dude. He was a revered senior pastor at a Baptist church in, in Georgia who his church decided for any seminary student, they would give his messages for free and send them to you wherever. I was a seminary student. You had me at the word free. <laughs> Got me at the word free. I'm like, send me those tapes. And so I would listen to this old Baptist preacher in Georgia all the time. And sometimes, to be honest, I was in a rush. And sometimes, maybe days and days and days, I was just didn't have the time to have a morning devotion and hear God for myself. So I would listen to this old Baptist preacher. And I would just listen to him and listen to him and listen to him everywhere I went. That old Baptist preacher isn't enough. 
I need to hear Jesus' voice more than his. You know what that old Baptist used, preacher used to say? I loved this. This is probably why I liked him. He used to say, I'm so glad Jesus got a hold of me before the Baptist did. <laughs> I was like, I like this guy. Let me just tell you, you, you may say, I know Billy Graham's voice. I, Billy Graham's not enough. You may say, my favorite podcaster, my favorite author, my favorite TikTok preacher. That's a thing. I'm not asking you, do you know their voice? I'm saying, do you know the voice of the shepherd? And the only way that you're going to get to fully know the shepherd's voice is through his word. And some of you are like, I'm not a reader. Amazing. You version, you can listen to it. Just press play. <laughs> and you can hear God's word being read to you to get to know the voice of the shepherd. Verse 5. Oh, verse 4. I skipped over verse 4, didn't I? I skipped over verse 4. Okay, verse 4. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. So this is about following, following the way of life, the decisions we make. Verse five, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The language here, recognize, the language here of knowing is all about intimate relationship. And that our ears are attuned, that our hearts of wisdom and discernment are able to, to tell the difference <coughs> between a voice, sorry, between a voice that is that of God, a shepherd, leading us to good places, and the voice of a thief, a robber, or a stranger who actually is over-promising but under-delivering, who is painting a picture, this looks good, but they're there to steal, kill, and destroy the warning that Jesus is giving is profound and we've got to pay attention in a moment like this. Look at verse six because here's the danger we have just like the Pharisees. Jesus used this figure of speech, this parable, but, but like, we should pause there, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. They didn't get it. They didn't get it because they were looking for something different than what Jesus was giving <clears throat> I made this chart just to maybe help us try to figure out what it is. See, the Pharisees were religious. You want to talk about the best of the best of religious, like looking the part, playing the part. They were religious, but it made them self-righteous. It made them, hey, look at me. It made them self-righteous, but Jesus is desiring a heart of love. That's why the Pharisees are more concerned about breaking the Sabbath than they are a man who is blind and healed miraculously of Jesus. The Pharisees were knowledgeable, but it made them proud. That's why the scriptures warn us knowledge can puff up if we're not careful. But Jesus desires transformation. Jesus isn't looking for information so you can be better at Bible Jeopardy. He wants a transformation of our hearts. The Pharisees were performance-based. They went to church more and they prayed more than anybody in this room. They practiced their religion. They were performance-based, but it made them self-centered. That's why you hear stories of them saying, I'm praying so that everybody can hear me. Jesus is looking for a God-centered heart, not a self-centered heart. The Pharisees were rule followers. They just followed the rules that they chose to follow. And it made them judging. Whoever didn't follow the exact specifics of the rules that they chose, they were very judgmental. And Jesus is looking for compassion in our hearts. It's a massive difference. And here at Hillside, our goal is not to help you be busier with religious activities. Does anybody need my help in being busier in life? No, that's, that's not our goal. Our goal is not to make you more knowledgeable alone, just going through motions and trying our best to follow all the rules. We're looking to be marked by the love of Jesus. We're looking to be transformed by his amazing grace. We're looking to have God at the center of everything we do and serving others out of a heart that is overflowing with the compassion of Christ, seeing others like Jesus sees them. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you, you, you don't get this. You, you, you're missing this. Even though it's right here. I, I, I like to say in black and red because the words of Jesus are in red in my Bible. It's right here in black and red. We just read his words. Verse 7, therefore, 
it means because they didn't hear the first time. Jesus said again, very truly, that's that. Amen, amen, that's that. Can I have your attention, please? I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. I am the door is another way that this could be translated. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the door for the sheep. Put that image up one more time of the, the sheep pen. Notice anything missing here? The door, the gate. So often in the ancient world, when a shepherd would put his sheep in a pen, often the pens had no gate or they had no door. And so the shepherd himself would lay down, sit down, place himself right there and would say, nothing gets in and nothing gets out except through me. He would say to those sheep, you are under my care. I have my eye on you. Nothing is going to get to you unless it first comes through me. And God says the same thing to us today. Nothing is going to get to you unless it first comes through God. Look at verse eight. Jesus says, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. There's those two words again. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep, like the real sheep, the, the, the ones that belong to the true shepherd, have not listened to them. Now, Jesus isn't going back into Old Testament history <coughs> and saying Abraham's a thief and a robber. He's not saying that. He's not talking about Moses. He's not talking about David. He's not talking about these prophets. But he is talking about people the prophets warned us about. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, different prophets, they said, watch out for shepherds who look good on the outside, but they're actually there for selfish gain. They're actually there to devour. They look a certain part, but they're going to lead you astray because they care more about themselves than they actually do for you. So be careful of those shepherds. And again and again and again, there's a warning. And Jesus says, all of those shepherds, and, and even the Pharisees, it's being applied to the Pharisees, and then read further on in the New Testament, and you'll hear warning warnings about false prophets and false teachers. And Jesus is basically saying, all of those who come before me are thieves and robbers and the sheep haven't listened because they're not the door, they're not the gate. Jesus says, I am. And if they're not telling you about Jesus, then they're leading you astray. It's, it's, Jesus is trying to make it as crystal clear as it possibly can be. Thief, and a robber are two different ways of talking about uh, the, the same kind of person. There's different tactics. One is by cunning and stealth. One is openly and violently. So beware of the subtle and beware of the overt. There's dangers lurking all around. Verse 9. Jesus says it again. I am the gate. And he's getting ready to say three things that will break down for a few minutes. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. That's number one, will be saved. Number two, they will come in and go out. That's number two. And then third, and they will find pasture. Jesus says, I'm the gate. I'm the gate and whoever comes through me, whoever enters through me will be saved. So that word saved is a, is a very important biblical word. If you've been around church any time at all, you've probably heard it, but you've also heard the word saved in other contexts, but, but what does it mean? Very often we define it only in an individual me and God kind of thing, and there is that dynamic, but it's also more than that. Let me give you a few examples. Number one, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God's saving work. We, we read a, a number of weeks ago in Genesis about how everything fell apart and there was this disconnect in our world in relationships spiritually and physically and Jesus has come to restore or to save all of the things that were broken in the fall of humanity. Romans chapter 10 verse nine, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be, what's the word? Saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Same word. And that does talk about every single one of us, an, an invitation to, to be saved, to say, Jesus, you are Lord, and 
I believe that you rose from the dead and God, forgive me and give me a new start. We're all invited into that, being saved. <coughs> Scripture tells us salvation is found in Jesus. Look at this slide real quick. A few different ways this is used. Matthew 121, an angel comes to Joseph. This is the Christmas story and says, call him Jesus. Call this baby Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Acts 4, 12, very early in the life of the early church, Peter begins to preach and they say, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name that you can be saved by. Ephesians 2, the apostle Paul writes, it is by grace you have been saved. He's basically saying, there's nothing you can do to earn it. You can say, I'm gonna try to be good. I'm gonna try to be better. I'm gonna try to be good. I'm gonna try to be better. And you can never be good or better enough. And you don't have to be. It's by grace you are saved through faith. First Timothy 1.15 says, it's Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not just bad people. Not just people we don't like. Not people we can put categories. Well, this, 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 this. Our greatest core need is we're sinners, not to list all the ways we sin, but to say we're sinners. We need salvation through grace alone. That's our greatest need. It's our greatest need. A number of years ago, <coughs> a few of us, Steve's there, we were in India. And we were dedicating a water well from Hillside Community Church. You had given graciously and generously for us to be a part of this water well. And there, there's a, like an insignia, a plaque that says something like, to the glory of God on behalf of Hillside Community Church. And now these school kids at this school in the middle of nowhere at this village are getting fresh water. But as we're celebrating and Wurzel's leading us in songs and the kids are singing and everything at the school, I start to look around and I'm like, huh. That's interesting. There's an icon to uh, another God. Oh, there's a, a picture of another God. Oh, there's a, there's a name of another God. Oh, there's, there's a name of another God. Huh. Oh, there's the name of Jesus, but then there's this picture of this other God. In, in a nation that worships 330 million different gods, in that moment I was like, here's the dilemma. Jesus is amazing. Add him to the list, 330 million and one. Is that, is that what Jesus is talking about when he says, no, 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 I'm the gate. I, I'm the door. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, and we can laugh about that in a context of, of, of a different place. But we can say, but don't we live a lot that same way when we come to church? But then we're like, Monday, don't tell me how to live, God. Uh, I, or we say, you know, God, I do need you, Jesus, but I also want to be in control, so I want to try really hard. And when I feel like trying really hard, I hope you're proud of me. And when I don't do so well, I hope you're gracious to me. And he's like, it's not by your effort. Salvation is by grace, period. It's this idea. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. You and I don't have anything to add. Christ has done all the work and he invites us into a relationship. We are saved by faith in Christ. And if you think this sounds a little bit exclusive, it is exclusive, but it's not my words. They're the words of Jesus. And if we are going to say he is who he says he is, he did heal those who are blind and give them sight. And on top of it all, he died and was raised to new life by the power of God. I'm listening to that guy. I'm following that guy. I'm saying his words are true. And this is what he says. I am the door. I am the gate. I got gotcha. you. But he's also saying I gave my life for you. So let's not mess around. We're saved by Christ. Salvation is in his name and his name alone. Secondly, um, Jesus says, if you're in my gate, you come in and you go out. You come in and you go out. And we're like, what does that even mean? Well, in the Old Testament, it was the kind of language that referred to freedom. That living your life free and living your life to the fullest. Not hashtag best life ever. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like this is deep and meaningful kind of things. Deuteronomy 28 says it this way. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out, in and out. Psalm 121 says, the Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forever. This is the concept of following God, following Jesus, listening to his voice and walking with him. And if 
you're saved by Jesus, and if I'm saved by Jesus, wouldn't our life look different? If we're saved by Jesus, your values change, your ethics change, the things you do with your free time change, the hobbies may be impacted, sorry to say. Your, your, the way you spend your money will look differently because there's transformation that's happening in our lives. We're not just saved, that's a start here, and like, yeah, I did that thing way back when. If we did that thing way back when, and then we went on to live our lives, we've gotta honestly ask the question, did I really do that thing way back when? Because if we're saved by God, then we stay close to him. Look at these scriptures. Staying close to Jesus looks like this, satisfaction. Not discontentment, satisfaction. This was week one of this series, John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever follows me will not be hungry. Last week we talked about when we follow Jesus, we'll have the light of life. Follow Jesus, we'll know the truth and be set free. Ephesians 3 says we'll have confidence to approach God. Are, are you confident in God right now? Like confidence is a boldness, it's a courage that I can be before God and I'm fully loved and fully accepted. I don't have to hide anything. I don't have to try a little bit harder. Just get this, God loves you just like you are right now. Whatever you did last night, whatever you said on your way to church, I come to church by myself. I just, I don't, I never blow it. I'm always by myself. I never say anything to anyone on the way to church because I'm all by myself and nobody's on the road. It's amazing. <laughs> God loves you just like you are, but he loves you too much to just simply leave us just like we are. And so confidence to approach God, Galatians 5.25 talks about, <coughs> sorry, living and keeping step with the Spirit of God. Keeping step with the Spirit of God. It's this, it's this freedom, it's this relationship. The part just before that in Galatians 5 is there's a whole list of things like, how can you do that and do that and do that and do that and say you follow Jesus? Because if you follow Jesus, you're marked by love, joy, peace, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All these things, the fruit of the Spirit begin to flow if we follow Jesus, there'll be change. We'll be marked by it, right? If he's the door, if he's the gate we're going in out and out of, we'll look like it. But Jesus isn't the only door that we can choose in life. Some of us go through other doors, and the truth is we start to look like whatever door we say. Some of, some of us, our door is success. Now, you're, you're not probably going to say my door is success. Some of you, can I just say, your door is success. If your door is success, then, then you are literally captivated. Your mind is captured by things like, how much money do I make? And I need to make a little bit more money. And you can't ever get over that. You know, when you're younger, it's just, what are your grades? What school do you go to? But then it becomes things like, what kind of car do you drive? Because if you're successful, if your gate is success, then you gotta drive a car that looks the part, right? If, if you're Gate is success, then you gotta dress a certain way because you're like, what will people think about me? I've gotta dress a certain way. Because success, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with cars or anything wrong with dressing nice. I'm just saying we gotta be aware of how subtle these things get into our lives. The things we value, the things we say, like that captivate our attention, we've gotta be careful. Anything that separates us from God Anything that doesn't allow us to stay close to Jesus, it's either an idol or it's an ideology, and it's got to go. It's got to go or we can't follow Jesus. Third, what he says after, you'll be saved, go in and out, you'll find pasture. Again, he's talking to sheep. He's a shepherd saying, I want to lead you to the green pastures. I want to lead you beside still waters. I want to lead you to a place where you get nourishment. We'll talk about part two of this chapter, I am the good shepherd, next week. But, but it's, it's, it's speaking to being supplied by Jesus. Saved by Jesus, staying close to Jesus, but then being supplied by Jesus. Things like Psalm 23 with, with the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I lack nothing. 2 Corinthians 9, having all that you need to abound. Philippians 4, 19, God will meet all your 
needs according to his riches. Like, like God is able to do this. It doesn't say, let's just be really clear, it doesn't say God will meet all of your wants. And sometimes I wish it would say God will meet all of your wants because I'm not knocking cars. The truth is I love cars. I actually want one. My 17-year-old stole mine from me. And so, but the idea is God will meet all your needs according to his riches. And James 1 talks about every good and perfect gift comes from God. We recognize this. Here's what's at the core of all of this being supplied. It's a relationship of dependence. And back in Exodus, what we talked about, when Adam and Eve took of a fruit to eat, here's what they did at the core. At the core, they said, we don't need you, God. We want to go our own way. That's the root sin of what they did. In picking this fruit, they were saying, God, we want to go our way. Independence. And we're created for dependence on God. That's the most amazing news if we got it, that we're saved by grace and we're supplied by God. It all doesn't depend on you. You don't carry the weight of the world or your family on your shoulders. When you are in Christ, you're a new creation and you're like, God's got this. He's in this with me. I'm just called to follow him. He's the provider, not me. And it changes the way we look at life. I am just, I'm not gonna have a voice tomorrow. I keep screaming. I'm supposed to calm down. Verse 10, <coughs> let me save some energy. Let me just gear up for one last round. Verse 10, here's what Jesus says finally in this section. The thief, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Before you answer this question, just hold on. Uh, I'm gonna ask in just a moment. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Before, don't answer this out loud. Think, who is the thief? And if we're not careful really quickly, what we'll say is the devil. No, it's not. It's been used two other times in this passage. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. A, a stranger or a thief, the sheep don't recognize his voice. In this passage, the devil doesn't even have to mess with the sheep because the bad shepherds are all around. The devil doesn't have to speak because there's other voices that are clamoring for their attention and our attention. And at this point, yes, the devil is real and he's an enemy. But at this point, it's not even the voice of the devil. It's the voice of other people who are leading us away from Jesus. And he's like, you better be careful the thief has three things steal kill destroy watch out those, those, those people we listen to those voices that we let in our that the American dream these things that we they're so subtle you're like everybody else is doing this Jesus says I've come that they could have life and have it to the full I'm old school, New King James is in my brain. I've come that they could have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life, life to the full. Let me just be honest, it doesn't mean long life. We're not promised long life. We're not promised easy, comfortable life. But we're promised a God who will be with us in it no matter what. When Jesus is our door and he is the gate, even though there's trouble, there can be peace that passes understanding. He will not leave us. We're never alone or forsaken. And he's like, I'll be with you and give you life to the full. Yes, in eternity one day, but it starts right here in this earth. Whatever you're facing, whatever's going on. But the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy and we've got to be careful of other philosophies, other views of the world, other values that get into our hearts. See, the quality of the sheep is really determined by the care of the shepherd. And sheep that are cared for, they're, they're not restless. Are you restless? Sheep that are deeply cared for, they're, they're not fearful. Are you fearful? Sheep that are desperately cared for, like lovingly cared for, aren't so overcome with anxiety because they found a shepherd who cares for them. Listen, we're going to struggle with anxiety and fear. We're going to have those things. The evidence of those things in our lives is not evidence of God's absence. But when we feel, sense those things, where do we go? We go back to being close to Jesus. We go back to being supplied by Jesus. Or, or, 
we realize we were never saved in the first place. And it all starts there. You're not, I just thought of this. You're not saved by Jesus just because you prayed a prayer 20 years ago. You may be, it may have been initiated by a prayer, but for some of us, we got caught up in an emotional moment. We had no idea what we were doing and we've prayed a prayer and that prayer's kept us from God for 20 years now. And today's the day to come back. Today's the day to make it real for the first time. There's a, there's a subtle trap to steal, kill, and destroy. Just look at this chart that Tim Keller uses that I think is so good. He talks about religion versus the gospel or a Pharisee approach, religious approach versus Jesus' approach. Here's what Keller writes. A religious approach says, I obey, therefore I am accepted. Meaning, I, I do right, and when I do right, God loves me, and I feel his love and his pleasure in my life. That is not the way of the gospel of Jesus. The way of gospel of Jesus is, I am accepted, even if I'm a mess right now, and therefore I obey. I obey because I am loved and because I've been transformed. That makes the difference. I don't obey first and then God chooses to love me. He's already chosen to love me. Religion, in, in religion, motivation is based on fear and insecurity. I hope you're paying attention, but there's all kinds of people stoking up fear and insecurity in this season. The way of the gospel the motivation is based on grateful joy. Grateful joy, thankfulness on who God is and what he has done, and, and a joy that begins to permeate everything. In religion, I obey God in order to get things from God. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, God, I came to church. Now you know that prayer I had last night. I'm ready. I'm like, seriously? I mean, we do it. We all do it, right? We all do it, but can we just be honest? It's childish. That's the way of religion, though, but the way of the gospel is I obey to get God and delight and resemble him. Whether I get the thing I've been praying for or not, God knows best, and if he wants to say no, I need to say okay, because he knows best. And then this takes it all the way back to the man who was born blind or the suffering in our lives. The way of religion, when circumstances in my life go wrong, I'm angry at God or myself since I believe that anyone who is good deserves a comfortable life. Who told you that? Thieves and robbers. Strange voices. Not the voice of the shepherd. The voice of the shepherd never said good people have easy lives. That is a lie from the enemy that he uses the thieves and robbers to spread. The way of the gospel says, when circumstances in my life go wrong, I struggle. And we could stop there, amen? <laughs> we struggle because we're real people. But I know that while God may allow this for my training, he will exercise his fatherly, or could I say also shepherdly love within my trial. The shepherd will not leave us. The father still loves, even when life is hard. Would you pray with me? Jesus, it's all about you. Even when we make it about all kinds of other things, it's all about you. Would you forgive us for the way that we listen to other voices? Would you forgive us for the ways that we are wooed by selfish motivations? by things that sound good to our ears, but we know in our hearts aren't from you. God, there's somebody here today that, as I was talking about what it means to be saved, they just, they just knew that they knew I'm not saved. <coughs> and they also knew, I need Jesus today. I need Jesus. I pray today that they would give you their lives. They would find you. They would repent from their sin and say, I'm sorry, and accept you as their Savior. There's others of us, Lord, that we just need your forgiveness. We need your grace again in our lives because we've been trying in our own strength and we're tired. We've been carrying burdens instead of casting them at your feet and we're exhausted. Yes, we're saved, but we've not stayed close and we're coming back to that place. 
Would you meet us right here in these moments? Would you remind us of your goodness? We're here for you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.